I did want to give a little bit of an introduction for those uh, watching this a little later on what we'll be talking about and um, a little introduction on Jen herself as well. So talking about uh, the when the Cleveland Metro Parks had received this donation from the Acacia Reservation, um, which was a former, former, uh, sorry, wow, words are hard today. When Cleveland Metro Parks received the donation from Acacia Reservation, formerly a private golf course and country club, the park district also received the mission, which is to restore the property of a forested public park. And we'll be learning about the steps that we've taken to uh, create the wetlands, restore streams, and then establish native metals and um, make it welcoming for the public. And a little bit about Jen Greaser herself. Jen is the Director of Natural Resources at the Cleveland Metro Parks. And then prior to joining Park District, Jen worked in New York City in the Department of Environmental Protections, especially the Stream Management Program upstate in the Catskills. Jen holds a master's in environmental science and natural resource management from Indiana University. And she spends most of her free time, whenever she could get that, carting her two boys around from sport to sport. And with that, I'll let you take it from here, Jen. Excellent, thanks so much. I'm really pleased to be part of this Northeast Ohio Youth Climate Future Forum. Um, I hope it's been um, an enjoyable event so far and I wish you all the best um, for the sessions to come. Um, I'm really pleased to describe our restoration activities at Acacia. It's been such an exciting pro process for us. But before I dive into the restoration activities, I just wanted to start by orienting you. Um, I know that we have a student from Akron and one from Olmsted Falls, so you may not be familiar with where Acacia is. So on the map here in the green, you will see that's generally our Cleveland Metro Parks properties. Um, ringing around um, the Cleveland area and divided into larger watershed. So on the western side is Rocky River watershed. In the middle is Cuyahoga. Over to the east is the Chagrin River. And then if you'll notice, um, there's a small watershed labeled Euclid Creek. And that little um, red circle is around Acacia Reservation. So if we zoom in, the, to Acacia Reservation, you'll notice on that map that the yellow lines, the, there's a lot of roads, um, residential development. Over to the east a little bit is a highway, that's 271. Um, due south of Acacia is Beechwood Mall. So if you've been there, you've been just across the street from Acacia. So it really is a very urbanized watershed. And that's something that's kind of critical to keep in mind as we talk about what we were able to do at Acacia and what it provides to Euclid Creek as a whole, because it really is in that upper headwater position um, before the water flows to Lake Erie. So um, Acacia was previously a private country club, um, operated for almost 100 years. It opened in 1921, and it was actually designed by a pretty famous golf course designer named Donald Ross. Here's a kind of a picture of what that looked like and, um, and the map showing that, that layout. But then we fast forward and, and this is what Acacia looked like when we received um, the property. It was actually a donation of about 155 acres and it was a significant um, kind of price point at $14.75 million purchased by the Conservation Fund. And actually that was largely due to a very generous um, donation that will, um, and the an individual wanted to remain anonymous. Um, so in 2012, the property was donated to us. And the unique aspect to that is that it came with very specific deed restrictions. So um, it really laid out this mission for ecological restoration to us and clearly said that it, um, the, the donor 
wished for passive recreation. So no more golf. Um, it wouldn't allow um, like baseball fields, soccer fields, basketball fields. Um, did permit um, limited development for picnic areas or shelters, um, but we had to um, limit that development and that impervious um, area to no more than two acres. So that was really exciting for me and my colleagues in our natural resources division, um, because that really kind of gave us the charge to think of acacia as a blank slate. And so this is what we sort of walked into. Those pictures on the left um, are, are kind of what you would think of when you think of a golf course with the typical fairways and the roughs, um, the cart paths. And then when you kind of dial down into the site itself, then that's where we saw more of those pictures on the right hand side, the stream bank erosion. We saw some crumbling pavement and asphalt and knew that we really needed to get in and repair the environmental services that this could offer. So we also wanted to make sure though, before we dove in to do those restoration activities, we wanted to make sure that we understood the site and that we really were intentional about each step of the way. Um, so that we weren't kind of willy-nilly. We wanted each action to complement the other. So I'm just showing a map of acacia and all of those dots are vegetation monitoring plots that we were able to set up before we started doing any disturbance. And then you see a list of some of the other surveys we did, such as stream surveys. We installed water level loggers. We installed flow meters. The graph at the bottom is showing some of that output of data of those flow meters, kind of showing how the water is um, uh, coming into the site and leaving the site. We did some deer spotlighting and soil mapping. And so all of that information then went into an ecological restoration master plan. Um, we were able to work with an environmental um, consulting firm called Biohabitats to develop that plan. And the map that you see on the right is sort of the pictorial image of that end product. Um, so please notice the overarching color on that map is green and the green stands for forest. So that was a big effort for this um, area was to increase the tree canopy at Acacia Reservation. I'll also call your attention to the kind of aqua lines with a blue line in the middle. Those are what I'm going to refer to as headwater swales. And then there's also some streams going through the, the property. So wetland creation and stream restoration were also big marching orders coming out of this plan. And all the while, we wanted to engage the public throughout this process. What an awesome learning opportunity for the public to be able to see what happens when you restore a golf course. So here are just some pictures of the different ways that we did that, whether it was through a public meeting or a bio blitz. We hosted a few different day in the life of Euclid Creek events. Um, and we also did high school classroom visits to Beechwood High School. Another thing that was really great and beneficial, we had um, a handful of students from Hawkins School conduct their senior capstone at Acacia. So they were able to install, what you see in that upper left-hand picture is a small um, kind of seedling enclosure to protect those seedlings from trees. Um, we worked with Beechwood High School again on a lot of water quality monitoring. And then throughout the, the process, we had various volunteer planting projects with all ages. You can see from, from tiny little scouts um, up to retired um, individuals. And all the while then, after we had this plan in place, we started to do in-house implementation. So we had acres and acres of basically this green carpet, which was the fairways, the golf course fairways. So we had to get in there with some pretty invasive equipment. Like um, on that left-hand photo, you can see the attachment from a tractor. 
And so then the tractor rips off that top layer of sod. And then the middle picture is where we get in and we can rip up and, and um, move that soil around. The right hand photo is then that, that prepared meadow area. And we seed that with native seed. And next thing you know, we get this beautiful pollinator habitat of diverse herbaceous and, and, and grass material that's beneficial to all kinds of wildlife. And I'll speak more to that later. Another thing um, that we wanted to do was um, develop some wetlands. Really, acacia is one of the best opportunities in the, the Euclid Creek watershed because it is so urbanized and built out. This is an area where we can try to capture as much water as possible. Well, the tiles are underground pipes, basically. So think of a golf course. Golf course managers want water on the landscape when they want it, so they do that through irrigation lines, but then they want the water off the landscape as quick as possible, and they use the tile, the underground pipes, to get that water off site. And that really sets up an unnatural hydrologic system, or basically an unnatural way the water is, is moving through the ground. It's leaving way too fast. So our staff got in there. With, this is a little mini excavator you can see in that photo um, to break up those tiles to, to hold the water and um, burn up it up. And then here's what you get are these wonderful wetland ponds that um, are available to all kinds of birds, especially migrating shorebirds. One thing we really had to be cognizant of was invasive plant management. Um, we're, we're not mowing in, and managing every piece of ground like golf course managers would, and that can le lead to the invasion of invasive plants, especially when you're surrounded with so much development and the roads, those are all ways that invasive plants can encroach on the landscape. So this crazy colored map that I share with you um, is just the way to show all the multiple treatments that we did have to do. Um, invasive plant management is not a one and done. It, it really is a labor of love to come back time at, and again um, to try to keep those plants at bay. And we largely did that throughout the entire area of Acacia Reservation. The picture on the right is just one of those plants. It's called Canada thistle, um, and that was one of our primary target plants. And getting back to, if you think of that map from the plan and all that green area that we wanted to reforest. So this was really a big um, initiative for our in-house staff. The upper left-hand picture is actually a photo where we were able to engage 100 staff from across Cleveland Metro Parks as part of our centennial celebration in 2017. Um, and then in that lower right-hand photo, you can see one of those cubes um, protecting tree seedlings that the high school students had built. And this was a really great visual because all of those little dark tufts behind that cube those were supposed to be seedlings too, but they're eaten by deer. So the protection of the seedlings, either planted or even just natural regeneration was really critical. And we even used fire out at Acacia to establish meadows and to maintain meadows. And it's a very controlled process. We have um, many staff that would, are on site and ready to um, respond if something did get out of control, but our staff make sure there's the right weather and everything to, to ensure that we're successful. But sometimes we needed to go above and beyond and, and outsource some of these restoration activities because the work that needed to be done was really extensive and did require um, actual engineering designs. So I'm just sharing you a couple of those conceptual designs um, for Euclid Creek and the headwater swales. And I'm gonna go through and show you some pictures of what that entails. So for Euclid Creek, we actually wanted to move the entire stream channel because it was so incised 
the water couldn't expand out onto its floodplain. So here are some of those steps from laying out a new channel on the left hand side, you can kind of see the stakes that are showing that and then excavating that new channel and it starts to take shape. And um, the bottom picture you can see where they're excavating a new floodplain. Um, they actually had to dig down and remove that material to allow the stream to get out on the floodplain. And that's really beneficial because that's how pollutants drop out of streams. It reduces downstream stream bank erosion. It's that capture of, of stormwater. All really critical in this age of climate change when we're getting these larger storm events, flashier storm events, we wanna to try to capture that water and slow it down. And here are a couple other ways that of uh, restoration kind of tools. Certainly native seeding is really critical, installing trees and shrubs and that live branch layering. That's getting all of that, the living aspects onto the landscape. And that's one of the things that I love about my job is we really rely on biology to do the heavy lifting here. So um, if I equate that to what we might refer to as gray infrastructure or the built environment, sometimes the, the strongest that that grows is the day that it's installed. But when we think of green infrastructure and these living biological elements, they are growing, they are getting stronger over time. And that's what makes this work so exciting. And here's just kind of a time lapse with the um, existing stream channel in the foreground and how it develops over time. And then we have the new stream channel in the background. And there it is. And then I'll, I'll go here to what, what did that look like? So the left-hand picture, the water is actually flowing from the right side of the picture downstream to the left. And then that right-hand picture is that kind of downstream end of the stream restoration project with the step pools before it enters the natural stream below. And here again is another progression of photos um, from the, the initial channel in 2016 before the restoration and then what it looked like in subsequent years. And, and it really, those photos show how that, that greenery and everything is really filling in and, um, and doing its job to create a really healthy stream environment. Now I'm gonna to switch to a different kind of restoration type and it's the headwater swales. So remember, there were no wetlands at Acacia prior to our, our work here. Um, a lot of that flow was under the surface in those tiles. So again, getting in, breaking up the tiles. And then because of the slope in some areas, we had to create a step pool kind of structure with small berms in the middle. And then that right hand picture shows you what that looks like at the end. And here is a, a little before and after. So again, we, we, we can see that there's sort of a swale um, topography to the landscape, um, but there's no water on the surface. And now we're able to capture that water and then you can see resulting photos, all these beautiful wetland flowers, the pickerel weed and the sparganium, the giant burr reed um, that is beneficial to all sorts of wildlife. Again, um, switching another gear to daylighting. So that upper left-hand photo shows a cart path as it travels over a big section of ground. The right-hand photo shows that ground. And then the bottom left is a picture of those big culvert segments. They were over five feet in diameter. And so we worked with a contractor to remove that and, um, and remove a lot of that soil. Um, and then we're able, that's why it's called daylighting because basically it's, it's giving the stream the light of day. And that is how we get all those beneficial environmental processes that help to alleviate pollution, but also um, are feeding the fish and the bugs that are living in, in the streams. And that could be a little daunting. Yes, there was a lot of heavy equipment used in those work, works and those projects, 
but we had a little help from our friends all along the way and all different types of um, volunteer groups assisted, whether it was putting tree fencing around the newly installed trees or doing um, some stream cleanups because unfortunately we do get quite a bit of pollution from the upstream watershed from Beechwood Mall and the businesses around there. Um, or maybe even just um, putting fences around the new seedlings coming up that, that are kind of volunteering on their own. So all in all, what did that mean for, for Acacia? Um, what, was, what was the overall result? And so in 2018, we hosted a BioBlitz for 44 participants. And a BioBlitz is basically, it's a 24 hour um, collection or observation of every living thing possible. Everything from plants and birds to slime mold, amphibians, fungus, mammals, you name it. We reached out to a whole bunch of different scientists and um, volunteers to assist with that effort. And the map that you see on the right hand side are um, those different points and, and it's shown in iNaturalist. So this is actually data that's available to anyone and where citizen scientists can contribute to additional um, observations through time. So in general, we were able to turn the four to a forest for fins, feathers, and fur. Um, we have a picture of pumpkin seed that was sampled from Euclid Creek. Uh, the next photo over, we have bumblebees and monarch that are feeding on um, swamp milkweed that was planted at acacia. The next photo over, um, it's probably hard to tell what's in that yellow circle, but it was actually a mink that I was so fortunate to observe hunting um, frogs and tadpoles in those newly created pools. And then on the far right hand side in that tree is a, a red tailed hawk uh, perched on one of the dead standing snags that we installed as part of the project. So as far as we've been able to tell, the efforts have been successful, um, not only for growing new vegetation and providing all of those wonderful benefits of carbon sequestration and storage and um, transpiration and, and, um, and soil rehabilitation, but we're also seeing the wildlife respond to those activities. And certainly, um, here is the summary of that work. This is really just a, a subset of statistics from 2014 to 2017. I'm not gonna go through all of those numbers. I just wanted to share with you that while there were a lot of environmental ben benefits of planting lots of trees and live stakes, you can also notice the human side that people were, um, involved throughout it. We had over 278 volunteers involved um, and our wonderful outdoor experiences division offered 164 programs for over 1900 guests. And if you, you zoom down your eyes to that last bullet, you'll notice that um, just in the first four years of Acacia being a park, over 450,000 people visited that um, area. And when we think about it having been a private country club before that, and now it's a public park, such a wonderful opportunity for people to be able to come out and enjoy. And you might be asking yourself, well, why does Jen have a picture of an elephant at, with this presentation? What does an elephant have to do with Acacia Reservation? Well, an el elephant's even benefited from our restoration activities. And that's the fun part of having the Cleveland Metro Park Zoo associated with us, because as part of the stream restoration, we did have to um, remove a, a couple of trees and those cottonwood are enjoyed by the elephants. So we were actually able to take that material over to the zoo so that they could have a fun time eating some of it or just playing around with it. So 
In summary, I'm um, really grateful to the wide array of funders that we had. We definitely could not do this with Cleveland Metro Parks dollars alone. We were so fortunate to have a number of grants at the state level with Ohio Environmental Protection Agency, uh, Family Trust with the, the Charles Pack Trust, up to the federal level with the US Fish and Wildlife Service, Great Lakes Restoration Initiative, and we're really fortunate to have the local support of Northeast Ohio Regional Sewer District with these restoration activities. I also just wanted to give a shout out to those heavy equipment operators and those brilliant consultants doing some of the design work of those more extensive restoration activities. That's through Biohabitats, Meadville Land Service, Sustainable Streams, and Sea Crump Incorporated. But I just want to remind you, none of that could have been realized without the energetic support of our volunteers who are so very critical to everything we do. And you can see that um, this whole slew, and it's so exciting to work with all these different types of people, whether it's the schools like Hawkin or Beechwood or those scout groups, the Cub Scouts and the Brownies or um, other groups like Urban Cleveland Squash and the healthcare scribes. And you'll notice we even had a couple employees from Under Armour join us. Um, so that makes our work so very exciting. And with that, I thank you for joining or listening to this recording later. Uh, here is my contact information. If you have any questions about what I shared or my um, office number, if you'd like to give me a ring, I encourage you to reach out.